Good morning. Give us a few minutes. We're going to get started with the Hudson Genealogical Study Group program momentarily. We're just letting everybody get settled and get in. While we're waiting, I have a few quick announcements. Um, please leave your questions in the Q&A section, as you normally do. Know that there is a handout, and it is, I believe, there is a link to it posted. And finally, um, if you drop us a note and let us know where you found out about the program, we'd be delighted. While we're waiting for people to join, I'll say good morning and what a wonderful Ohio Saturday morning it is. We're delighted to have you all. There is a handout for this and it's in the chat box so you can all click it and download it. Please leave your questions in the Q&A box and if you get a moment please leave us a note and let us know how you found out about the program. We would be delighted. This morning we have Vicki Albu with us. She is with the Romanian Genealogical Society. I believe she's the current president. Is that true, Vicki? I'm actually the past president. Oh, past president. Thank you for the correction. And she's going to speak to us about beginning Romanian genealogy research. So if you all are ready, I think I'm going to hand it over to Vicki and let her get started. Thank you, Vicki, for joining us. Thank you. So I need to know if you're able to see my presentation screen. Not yet. Okay. I think you have to hit that share screen button or something. Well, it's just not. Uh... Just one moment, please. We'll be right there. As oh, that's not know, what I wanted. <laughs> technology has its challenges. I'm so sorry. I'm just trying. There's not a share screen button showing up for me. It says swap presenter view and slideshow. Um, hang on. Let's see if I can help you on this end. Thank you so much. Here we go. Did Maybe. you find it? Maybe. I, yes, you did find it. Thank you. I'm so sorry. Oh, no, I was just explaining it. that I have uh, having troubles getting used to Zoom. So uh, I better get with the program here. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me today. I uh, appreciate it. Um, I uh, just need to adjust a couple things on my screen. Okay, well, I like to start with a little taste of Romania by sharing this um, Romanian adage, Cinevrea miesul sa sparga nuca, which means, in order to eat the kernel, you have to crack the nut, because that is so true to the practice of genealogical research, and especially Romanian research. My grandma would have actually said, uh, she would have agreed, and she would have said, uh, told you not to be a lazy lamox and to work hard, but this says it just a little bit nicer. <laughs> and this is not a picture of my grandma, but a Romanian lady called Grandma Nelly, who was pouring us some cherry liqueur in the morning for breakfast when I visited Romania. So, uh, my background... Um, I've been doing genealogical research since the 1980s, but I was frustrated because I didn't know very much about my Romanian immigrant great-grandfather who came to Minnesota with his family in 1911, and um, he, uh, he was very difficult to find. I, can't even, I still can't find him in the 1920 census, and so um, I wouldn't, couldn't find much about him, so I started researching other Romanians in Minnesota, which led me to connections in Chicago and then other places. It just spread out from there. And I found all of these other people who were also stuck in their Romanian research. 
So my interest in Romania led me to connect with more recent Romanian immigrants in Minnesota. I was part of the co-founding of a cultural organization here called Heritage Organization of Romanian Americans in Minnesota, or HORA, which is a lot easier to say. And um, that really helped me to learn more about Romania and the language. And uh, then in 2011, I co-founded Romanian Genealogy Society with a fellow researcher who was also finding roadblocks in her research. And in 2016, we went to Romania as uh, tourists, but also to do research in the archives there. So, um, and there we are in the Mary Cemetery of Sapanta in Romania. I'm the one on the far right um, with some of my colleagues. And um, so I'm happy to share some of the things I've learned over the past several years with you today. So I've listed on the screen an overview of what I plan to cover today, but I know you saw that because you signed up for the uh, session. But I wondered if um, we, I could ask people to uh, take a, a put in the chat box um, some things that you want to learn today or questions that you might have. And um, I'd also like to ask you to hold your questions until the end of the presentation. I mean, you can submit them now and I'll answer them at the end of the presentation if there's something that I didn't cover. But I'm just curious to find out why, uh, why you are here and how I can help you. This, it's, this slide is just an extremely abbreviated version of, or summary of Romanian immigration um, because uh, we don't have enough time to go into it in depth. But um, in general, before 1900, most were Jewish Romanians who came from the old kingdom of Romania to the United States. Um, the largest wave of immigration was about 1905 to 1920. Uh, most of those from um, Transylvania and Banat, which are regions that were then not parts of Romania. Um, like many other ethnic groups, first came the men. And then they, you know, many of them intended just to stay long enough to earn their thousand dollars and go back home again. Um, but ended up staying, sent for wives and so forth. And so um, we ended up with um, quite a large, not as many as other ethnic groups, but quite a large population of Romanians um, in industrial cities of the Midwest, primarily, not exclusively. Um, you know that because in Ohio, you have, uh, you had uh, large numbers in Cleveland and Canton. And um, they were extremely mobile. In fact, I was surprised at how frequently families moved around. And um, I said that their, their motto could be, we'll, we'll move for jobs, because they did move really frequently to be with family and uh, friends from their um, home communities, which is, again, as common with, um, with many groups. Uh, John Coletta, the well-known genealogical speaker, says, your purpose is to discover the particular story of your individual ancestor by gathering fact after fact. We need to weigh the evidence from multiple sources to prove our hypotheses about the lives of our ancestors. We all know that not everything that was written down was right, even if it was written down, if we were that lucky. Um, so we need to compare sources and make assessments about the accuracy of each document. And I really can't stress this enough. Most records from Romania, for example, church records, uh, church registers are not available online like they are for many European countries like Hungary. There are a few, but not very many on ancestry. And I get a lot of questions from novice researchers who think that just because they found a record online that contains their ancestor's name, they think that must be the right person. They don't know that their person was ever in that village where the record was created, but they're willing to assume the risk that it's him just because they're excited to finally find something. But that's not research, it's just a random guess. I always explain that genealogical research is like putting together building blocks. You need to follow this logical process and it's not always easy. I think we need to ask ourselves, are you, are you searching or researching? Because we all know as genealogists how exciting it can be to finally make that giant leap across the ocean once we think we found a place to look. But you know how it goes. Um, there are usually common names that repeat within families or within villages. And you need to be certain absolutely that you're tracking the right person. So the better you can firm up your research in North America, the better your chances will be when you get into Romanian records. And um, it's also important not just to research your direct ancestors and his family members, siblings, cousins, et cetera, but also his friends 
who will almost certainly be related to him either by blood or marriage. Um, for example, when I look at passenger lists, I always research every other person from the same village who was on that ship with him, at least on that page, and who were listed at, as um, their destinations as well. Because this can be really useful if you aren't finding much about your ancestor, you might find something um, through their uh, collateral lines. Um, where's Romania? Uh, I always include this slide because I find that most people are not very familiar with the geography of Eastern Europe. Genealogists are probably uh, not in that bucket, but I'll still um, talk about it anyway, um, just to make sure um, that everyone knows where Romania is today. Um, it's it, I'll go into the reasons why that's not, it hasn't always been the, the same map. Um, Romania borders Ukraine to the north and east, Hungary to the west, Serbia to the southwest, Bulgaria to the south, Moldova to the east, and the Black Sea on the southeast. And with a population of 19 million people, it is the sixth most populous member of the European Union. Its capital and largest city is Bucharest, which is down in the southeastern part of the country, almost near the border with Bulgaria. Um, the people are primarily Eastern Orthodox Christians, and they speak Romanian, which is a Romance language, meaning it's rooted in Latin. Um, a brief historical background, because we don't have that much time, right? Um, the map of Romania is very different today than it was until the 20th century. Uh, most of our Romanian ancestors who came to the U.S. and Canada in the early 1900s were living in what was then the Kingdom of Hungary in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And that causes confusion among modern day researchers, uh, myself included when I was starting out, because our ancestors were recorded in the census or other records as being Austrian or Hungarian. And um, I'll just briefly say that the end of World War I resulted in the dissolution of Austria-Hungary. Um, the principal beneficiaries of this territorial division were uh, pre-war um, were um, the Kingdom of Romania, the Czechoslovak Republic, and the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. One of the main points of the Treaty of Trianon after the war was this doctrine of self-determination of peoples, and this was a supposed attempt to give non-Hungarians their own national states, but it's really not possible to put all people of one ethnic background in, into, you know, single countries as we've seen uh, what does what happened after that um, but what happened then was renaming everything was renamed including streets cities villages the names of counties rivers and so on the spellings of people's names often changed as well and so maps will obviously be affected by these changes and so you need to think about this when you're planning to look for records about your ancestors in europe Throughout our research, we're building on evidence so that we can pinpoint with accuracy the village of origin. That's where we're all looking to find so that we can make that leap. Um, I know we each have our personal preferences for how we do, uh, how we go about our genealogical research. For example, I primarily use Ancestry, but I also use Family Search because it's free, but also because it has more extensive passenger list data, at least in my experience, I find it easier to find. Um, and since most Europeans uh, use MyHeritage, I use that sometimes too to look for trees and other clues that might help me with my uh, Romanian research. So I've listed on the screen some of the main places where we typically find clues to the village of origin. You're usually not going to find it neatly in one place or find it right away. Um, usually you'll have to analyze numerous sources. And I think you as genealogists are probably familiar with most of these um, military draft registrations, for example, in naturalization records, but I'll touch briefly on alien registrations um, because they're somewhat unusual. And later on, I'll show you the um, Steve Morse. Well, I don't know if we'll have time, but I wanna talk about the Steve Morse website. And I'll also give an example of a gazetteer.
So alien registrations were required of um, the United States government and state governments during war times of persons who had not become naturalized citizens yet. And uh, most states eventually destroyed these records, but there are still some for a few states, a handful, um, including Minnesota. So I know it's hard to read on the screen, but it contains rich information that you may not find anywhere else. For example, in this place, this is Paul Albu. He was the grandfather of my um, husband. And he here it says he was born in Romania in 1878. And it gives um, his arrival date, tells whether he was married, where he was living, uh, the names of his children. But one thing that I have never found anywhere besides this form is that he had one son in the Romanian army. We still don't know who, what, who he was. We think we know, but we're not sure. And one brother in the Romanian army. It also tells us that he owned livestock. Um, he owned horses. Uh, machinery, I think it is. At first, I thought... It, it's M-I-K-Y, but I think it's M-C-H-Y, abbreviation for machinery and cows. And uh, he was taking a, a try at uh, being a farmer for a while, which was not successful. And he went back to his um, industrial job, unfortunately. Um, this form also shows us that he owned some property that he sold. So that gave me a, another clue of where to look for him. Um, another example of a record that might point to the village of origin, we're trying to get more precise than just Romania. Um, Paul Elbu died in 1940, and the informant on his death certificate was his wife, Lydia, who was of German background. And she says that her husband's parents were John Elbu and Petra Krova, who were both born in Austria. And I later learned that is because the area where they lived was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire until 1918. But um, in the beginning, I thought, oh, they're Austrian. Um, but here in 1940, uh, John's brother, Paul, and his wife, Anna, are shown as being born in Hungary. So I'm back to Hungary again. But their lodger, Ella Costa, says that she was born in Romania. But on Paul Elbow's citizenship certificate in 1934, his birthplace is shown as Yugoslavia, two separate words, the way that it was spelled at the time. And then finally, when we looked at the Declaration of Intention and the petition for naturalization, we saw a specific town name. And I can't pronounce it properly. Some of you might know Hungarian, but I don't. It was Naj Tarnak in Hungary. Austria, they added for uh, clarity. I, I want to point out a mistake that some people make when they look at the naturalization records. They 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 zero in on you know the index might land you on the page with the declaration of intention, but if you go back a few pages or scroll up or down the page, look to see if there's a certificate of arrival attached. This is a bonus because it will tell you with certainty the name as it was spelled when that person arrived. And that's when I use that exact spelling to look on family search for the passenger list. Um, but it tells the date and port of the arrival and the name of the ship. So then you can take that information from the certificate of arrival and verify um, that it is, is your ancestor on the passenger list, which I'll show you on the next couple slides. Because with a name like John Albu, it's actually a pretty common name, John being the most common Romanian name, and Albu meaning white. Um, so there are a lot of them, and I wasn't sure I was finding the right passenger list. So on this um, manifest, passenger manifest or passenger list, on line two, we have Janos Elbu, Janos, J-A-N-O-S, as it was spelled on the certificate of arrival. And here it shows his last residence um, as the city of Naj Torak. And under nationality, it shows Hungary. Under race or people, it says Romanian. And always look for the second page of the passenger manifest, except for the earlier ones. There was only one page, but a lot of people miss the second page. And um, here we have the um, name and address of the person he is heading to in the United States. And we can confirm the date of arrival 
Yep, it was September 7th, 1909, the same as on that certificate, and um, the same in, as in his naturalization record, and we see that his place of birth was also Najtorak, so now we can be fairly certain that we should be able to find a record of his birth in this village, but how to figure out where that is, that's a future step. Just a good time to talk very briefly about the difference between a person's ethnicity versus their nationality. Um, ethnicity refers to their shared cultural or historical identity based on their common ancestry, heritage, language, religion, or other shared background, regardless of the geographical location, while nationality refers to this legal relationship of um, with that particular country. For example, your passport shows the country from which you hold your nationality. And if you look at this 1910 map depicting the ethnic groups of Austria-Hungary before World War I, you can see the effects of historical migration. There were ethnic Germans, shown by red on the map, scattered across Hungary, Banat, Transylvania. Um, ethnic Hungarians are shown in green. They were living in eastern Transylvania. Romanians are shown in orange, and they were spread across areas of Croatia, Banat, Transylvania, and up into Bukovina to the edges of the Russian Empire, and so on. And uh, what I think is interesting about this map, it doesn't even depict the Roma or Gypsy people anywhere on the map. So um, sometimes we can't find our ancestor because maybe the person who indexed that passenger list couldn't read Hungarian handwriting or they spelled it wrong or the name isn't spelled the way that you expected it to be. So if you haven't used it, the, I really encourage you to look at stevemorse.org. It's all one word. Um, and uh, it has a search feature that allows you far more creativity than the standard searches you can do on, you know, Family Search or Ancestry or other sites. And what is really useful, I think, is that you can target it by ethnicity. So you can look for all people named John Albu uh, from who were ethnic Romanians or who were Jewish or who were Hungarian or so forth. Um, it also has some uh, enhanced features like um, the town name sounds like or includes certain letters. And that can be really helpful. You can search by ship name, port name, age at arrival. Um, there's just a, a lot of different things you can do on that website, but um, that's sort of a whole topic to itself, but that is one that I find really, really useful if you haven't been able to find your ancestor any other way on passenger lists. So back to my point about ethnicity. Um, not all the people, obviously, who live in Romania are ethnic Romanians, and not all ethnic Romanians live within this political boundary of today's Romania. You can see the um, on the map where, um, you know, it's 89% Romanian, but still 6% of the population is Hungarian, uh, estimated 3.4%. These are... Um, current figures so they've changed obviously especially um, Jewish because of the pogroms and you know ethnic cleansing and so uh, but today it's 3.4 percent uh, Roma 0.3 percent uh, Ukrainian um, there's so few Jews left in Romania that it doesn't even register in the top lists of ethnicities Uh, and again, these are recent figures, so they're greatly different from the times when most of our ancestors emigrated, but it shows that um, Romanian Orthodox is the most common religion, but you can't always assume that about your immigrant ancestor. There, there are other uh, religions that our ancestors practiced. Um, uh, some of the Protestant uh, people, especially from Banat region, um, were, came to the United States because of discrimination, for religious discrimination, for example. Um, five percent today are Romanian Greek Catholic. It used to be a larger percentages, but so you want to find out because eventually you're looking in church records and you want to find out what religion your ancestor practiced when he or she um, was in Europe. So if you know the village name as it was in Hungarian, for example, we found Naj Tornak, Torak. Um, if you find this on a pre-World War I passenger manifest or some other document and you can't find it um, using Google or looking on maps, um, you can try using a gazetteer. 
And this is um, one of the, my favorite ones is the Genealogical Gazetteer of the Kingdom of Hungary by Jordan Auslander. And he based it on the 1877 um, information. So you can use it, it's sort of like a dictionary of place names. And here we can find out when we look up, it's, it's listed by names of Hungarian villages. And then at the back, it has a list of the Romanian names and you can look at what the former, uh, former name was. Uh, in this case, under Naj Torak, it says that um, the town name uh, could be Naj Torak or Naj Tor Tarnok in Torontal County, which was in uh, a district in Hungary I cannot pronounce, Naj Bekskerek, and the town is now called Veliki Torak, Serbia. The Rom Roman Catholic population in 1877 was 137 with the parish church located in Bega St. George. There were 25 Greek Catholics whose parish was in Petroman. There were 3,194 Greek Orthodox whose parish was in Arad. But if you look at the instructions in the front of the book, if the town name is in all caps, that means they also had a church in the town. So uh, it gets a little confusing, but I learned a lot about the village. Um, there were 12 Reformed Protestants and 16 Jews who worshipped in Najbekskerek. So using that, now I know if I think my ancestor was um, probably because the population, they probably were Greek or, or Eastern Orthodox, because that's the majority. And our family thought that he was um, orthodox so that is where we are going to look for the records of course now as fate would have it i can't find those records in romania because today that location is in serbia so now i have to deal with um, serbian archives and a priest who apparently didn't donate the records to the archives and keeps them in his attic but that's beside the point for today <laughs> So here are several tips to try when you're searching for your ancestors in North American records. You've probably heard the saying that spelling doesn't count in genealogy. And um, so it's really true of Romanian research. So if you're looking at indexes, remember again that maybe the person doing the index didn't know, you know, couldn't read the handwriting or weren't familiar with the names and so on. So when you're searching, then don't click the boxes for an exact search or you might miss out on a lot of clues. You're going to have to experiment a little bit to see um, <clears throat> what works best for you, but um, try all possible variants of the name that you can think of. How, how did it sound? Um, you might want to look at a Romanian pronunciation. You can Google and find a, a list of alphabet and pronunciation so that you can learn, for example, that the CH sound, CH sound is k in Romanian, and maybe that affected how the name was, was spelled, things like that. Um, also, try switching the last name and the first name, since in um, most uh, formal documents, European documents, the surname will come before the given name. Um, you can also look for Americanized names. You know, maybe he went by uh, Steve Jones or something in instead of Todor Ionescu. And um, not everyone came through Ellis Island. We kind of think that, but and perhaps a majority did, but not everybody did. Some came through Baltimore or Canadian ports. Um, again, use that Steve Morse website and uh, just keep an open mind. So these are just some examples uh, of name variations you might find. Um, the top row are actually, this top part of the chart are actually equivalents, but the ones on the bottom are just examples. They're not, they're not equal. They're just things that I've seen, uh, anecdotal. Uh, so uh, American English name John, you may find on the passenger list as Janusz, as we saw, or a Romanian equivalents would be Jan, spelled different ways, I-O-A-N-J-O-A-N-I-O-N, I'll pronounce the same. Um, Nicholas is the equivalent of Miklos, which surprised me, I thought it was Michael, um, and Romanian equivalent is Nikolai, and Eli it's not that different. Hungarian would be Ilish and in Romanian Ilia. But um, what I have seen on the bottom are just examples of Americanizations. And they sometimes people didn't even legally change their names. Uh, they just adopted these uh, Americanized versions of, for example, if his name was uh, Vasily or Vasily, I guess some people pronounce it, or Kiriak, um, the name 
sometimes they would take the name Charles, or if his name were Dimitru or Mitru, I've seen Dan or Mike. Um, Todor, Theodor turns into Steve or Ted. Um, Oral and Earl are not that different. Um, nicknames uh, for women, uh, Veta or Vera for Saveta in Elisaveta, uh, Lena and Helen for Elena, Kiva or Pauline are sometimes nicknames for Paraskiva, and uh, Sidi or Sadie, Sid, <laughs> Sidi or Sadie are nicknames for Persida and, and so on. <laughs> and then surname examples are, I mean, there's just no rule at all. It could be almost anything, but I probably should have reversed these columns. But if a person's name on the right-hand side, for example, were Kindia in Romanian, uh, would be spelled with a K in Hungarian. And in, in the United States, usually uh, they would use the K just because otherwise we're going to pronounce it Chindia, which would be wrong. Um, uh, one of my relatives is uh, her ancestor's name was Binsensen. The T uh, in the far right column, the T with the little diacritical hook underneath is pronounced tz. and so Binsensen is spelled then in Hungarian with some, they had some z's in there um, and in the United States they took the name Binsen <laughs> it was just easier that way and so these are just some other examples and you can see those in your um, handout oh maybe I'll, I'll say about the fifth one down Krachun means uh and in hungarian would be spelled with a k romanian with a c um, but the actual uh, meaning of that word is christmas and so sometimes people may have taken that name christmas as their surname so it can get uh it's kind of fun to find these examples Okay, so finally you have graduated and you're ready to try Romanian uh, research in Romanian records. And um, this is a picture of my great uncle who uh, graduated from the University of Minnesota and uh, as one of our family artifacts, <laughs> like he was the, uh, 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 he graduated as an engineer from the university. So that was a big thing. And it was published in the America Romanian Daily News, which was a newspaper you might be familiar with. I don't know. It was published in Cleveland. Um, and uh, it was distributed to Romanian Americans in the United States and Canada. And uh, that is another source that I, uh, when I mentioned newspapers, I should have brought that up. Um, but um, we're going to do research in Romania. So as I may have mentioned uh, in a nutshell, they're going to be kept in either the churches or in a local government office, usually the mayor's office in the comuna or the main city, um, or in a county branch of the National Archives of Romania. But you can see from our discussions today how important it is to understand where your ancestral village existed on the map at the time when the event occurred and the, and the record was created. Um, and then today it's in it will still be in that physical location but within the county that exists there today if that makes sense so um, talking about today's administrative structure of Romania um, by that I mean the organization of the various divisions of governments um, similar to what we have <clears throat> here in the United States so there's a county and a capital city of each one. And what is it's slightly different in Romania is that smaller villages are often under the umbrella of a larger city called comuna or a commune that holds its records. And uh, I suppose that somewhat similar to our rural townships. So it's important not to know not just the village and possibly the commune where the records of the, your ancestor may be found, but also to know what was his or her religion. And that's because until fairly recently, the record keepers of uh, vital records like births, marriages, and deaths were uh, kept by the churches. Um, uh, after 1895, well, and it varies within Romania, old Romania versus the unified greater Romania after World War I, but civil registrations, the ones kept by the government, um, are kept in the city hall. But regardless, when records turn 100 years old, they're supposed to be turned over to the local county branch of the Romanian National Archives. And that is where we usually go to look. Um, you can read more about this on the website of Romanian Genealogy Society. And um, I think that is on your handout as well. 
Uh, but just like in the United States, <laughs> with county boundaries changing, um, since uh, Romania was, um, the unified Romania was created after World War I, the county boundaries have changed. There have been other wars. Um, parts of what were once, what were Romania after World War I, for example, Moldova, um, are not, no longer part of the country. Um, so there's some parts that are now in Ukraine. Um, and so on. So just to be aware that if you don't find the record in your county where you expect to find it, you still might need to look at the neighboring counties um, to see if it might be found there. And just to recap, again, keep in mind uh, in what year was the record created, which church denomination did my ancestor follow, where were the church records kept, where were the civil registrations kept if they were kept at that time? And is the record over 100 years old? You, I believe you can still get records if they're under 100 years old, if you can prove that you are a direct ancestor of that person. But um, it's, it's more difficult. It's a pretty strict privacy law. So... <clears throat> um, most records we already said are not online but but look definitely look before you uh, go to looking in the archives look to see if they might be on ancestry or someplace else um you need to f maybe you can find a, a someone else who's a researcher in the same area uh, we have a list of professional researchers at romanian genealogy society and usually a local researcher will be more knowledgeable about the situation with the records, they might have relations with relationships with the archival staff, and they just will be a lot more helpful than stumbling around if we don't know anything about it. But um, you did, you do need to know an exact date. The staff at the archives can't do research for you, so if you don't know the exact date, you probably do want to um, hire a researcher. You make your request directly to the county archives. And you can email or write or visit in person. Um, it's preferred to communicate in Romanian. Um, they, it's you'll have better success rates. Um, uh, I have successfully uh, written, emailed, and hired a researcher and gone in person. So uh, I really think hiring a researcher is uh, probably more affordable in the long run. Um, realize that records will be kept in many languages and formats, and so you'll want someone that can interpret that for you, or you may need to hire an interpreter. And um, as I mentioned, there's generally a 100-year privacy law. As I mentioned in 2016, I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to do some in-person research at the archives branch in Timisoara, which is in far western Romania. And because we didn't speak Romanian, and uh, at least not fluently, we hired a guide, which was well worth it. She helped us through the process to register. We had to make an appointment. We had to obtain a license to take photos of the records. Um, and she helped us when we needed to communicate with the staff. There were very strict rules about how many books per day you can look at and so on. Um, each county branch has a list of its fonds or its holdings. Some of those are online on the National Archives website. Uh, in Timisoara, they were in a printed book on the desk inside the research room, which probably doesn't help you if you aren't there. So that's, again, why you need to hire a researcher. Um, and you can use that to identify the church registers that you want to look at. And here's uh, an example. We were allowed to take photographs. You had to put a little transparent tape that said National Archives of Timish or something on it and um, but we had the actual uh, you know these it was just treasures to touch and hold these books and in each book it lists the name of each researcher that's access the book that was kind of a neat tool also so here's an example of an 1857 Greek Catholic death register from the Timish archives, and it gives information you would typically expect to find in a death record. So this one was um, fairly straightforward and easy to read, sort of, <laughs> in comparison, I guess. Um, so this is a list a listing of seven different death records. Um, professional re researchers will typically provide translations of any records, such as this, 
Um, and it's something that you should verify before you make the agreement to hire the research to make sure that's part of the services that they'll provide. Um, but this is an example of what was provided to a client. And this is uh, a death record from a Romanian Orthodox Church uh, register. Um, so it tells us that Anna, wife of Pantelia Serafolian, died at age 38. And this is, um, she was Greek Eastern Orthodox from in uh, San Nicola Mare. And it does not tell the names of the parents as some of our death records would, um, but records in Romania will vary. It depends on the priest, the format. Um, so you never know exactly what you'll find. It's always a surprise. And this one is my holy grail. This is what I've been researching for for over 30 years. It's the birth or baptism record of my Romanian great grandfather, who was Ilya Moisescu, who was born in 1875. And I was surprised to find that he was baptized in the Serbian Orthodox Church. And this record is from the Romanian uh, archives in Timiš. Um, and I found out the reason why it was a Serbian church was because there was no Romanian Orthodox church in his town until after he was born. So in this case, notice the Cyrillic script. It's a little bit like Russian, but not, but at least I could make out some of it. But I did have to hire a, a professional researcher to really help me understand his family's records. Um, his name at baptism was not Eli, Eli at all. It was Toma. The, and he used the name Eli in America. My grandma told me that he had changed his name after he came to the U.S. because he was running from the draft, but I really never believed her. His story kind of didn't make sense, but here he is with a different name, but I know it's him because it does list the name of his father that, that I was told. There were hardly any Moisescu's in the town, so I can be certain that this was him. The dates were right. Um, so yeah, Toma. So I think you'll I always find surprises in Romanian research. So if you want to expand your knowledge, these are some of the places where you can look, the best places. Um, uh, local genealogical societies, obviously you know that because you're participating in this talk today. But uh, talking to like-minded people and people with similar challenges can be really useful. University libraries are sometimes an, an overlooked resource for, for genealogical research. And I think um, uh, I found at the University of Minnesota uh, some records of um, fraternal benefit organizations, for example, or um, you just kind of never know what you'll find, manuscripts and so forth. Uh, I'm sure that you would find that in Ohio. Um, local libraries, local Romanian churches might be helpful, um, local Romanian cultural organizations. Um, usually they are more recent Romanian <clears throat> immigrants to the United States, but they might, they will probably be supportive and helpful. They might not be so interested yet in genealogy, but I tell them, you know, your grandchildren will care that you're, that you're involved in, and we found a lot of support from our local uh, Romanian cultural organizations. Um, Romanian Genealogy Society, if I can include a pitch there, and a documentary film that we made uh, together with that HORA uh, organization um, called A Thousand Dollars and Back. And we did um, oral history interviews with uh, children and uh, grandchildren of original immigrants and told the story of how they how they came to Minnesota, um, some of them by way of Chicago and, you know, other other ways and what it was like for them, uh, because really Romanian research is not very well documented and we wanted to do that. So um, this is a film that can be watched online for free. And uh, I think I gave you a link to that in the handout as well and here on the screen. Um, and again, I need to pitch Romanian Genealogy Society and the resources we've put together to help people with their research. We have a website that's um, always undergoing uh, improvements uh, and development, a membership uh, with a quarterly newsletter. We have online meetings. Um, we have a, a, a really unique and growing library in the Minnesota Genealogy Center here in Mendota Heights, Minnesota. Um, we've got books that you will not find anywhere else and some that you will. Um, for example, we have uh, not a complete collection of the New Pioneer, but it was a, a, a magazine newspaper that in English that was distributed in the 19th 
40s. Um, we've got our newsletters. We have submitted family histories. If you have one, we would love to have yours. Um, we have a Facebook research group that anyone can participate in to ask questions about Romanian research. And we do provide uh, some research advice to members, although we can't do research, you know, in-depth research for people, but we'll try to help. So I listed the website and um, on the research section of the website is a document called Researching Romanian Ancestors. And you can check that out as well. So that's all available to the public. And after that whirlwind of fast talking, I've reached the conclusion. Thank you, Multimask. And um, if we have questions, now is the time that um, Gwen will let me know and I will try to answer them. Sorry, I gotta unmute myself. That's okay. Yes, we have questions. And thank you very much. It was very educational. Thank you. Um, first of all, Jeffrey says he's looking for evangelical church records for his maternal grandparents born in Transylvania. He was born in 1890 in Vila Teshi and she in Hosmus in 1897. Any ideas? Um, well, I'm assuming because it's evangelical church records that perhaps his ancestors were German. Um, there should be, uh, the records would be in the archives for that county. You'd have to find out, um, perhaps using a gazetteer or Googling to find out where Vile Tichy, Tich, and or Tich, where it's located. Sorry, you can tell I don't speak Romanian fluently. Um, also, uh, German communities often have put together uh, books about community because um, this, well, that's another presentation too, but they do often have books about community histories. So that's another um, possibility as well. I would find out for sure which, which county is, find out a little bit more about it. If they're Germans, maybe they're um, part of the Transylvania Saxons group that have been there for, you know, hundreds of years and there could be some um, history books written about that. If you're not successful, you can shoot me an email and I'll try to answer that better. <laughs> Peter says his great granny's nickname was Yeti or Jet Jetty with a J. What birth name should I be looking for? Well, that's a good question. Um, does he, I'm almost wondering if, if it's a Jewish name, maybe. Um, I would Google that name. I would uh, look for, do some searching on, um, whatever, if you use Ancestry or Family Search to, for that exact, you know, see if you can find other people that have that name or that nickname and see if you can deduce something from that. I have not heard of that before. Um, that doesn't mean it, you know, it's not common, but I just haven't heard of it. Esther, no, wait a minute. Elaine says, what's the best place to find Romanian church records? Um... Are you looking? I don't know what uh, specifically in the United States and Canada. Uh, obviously, you need to contact the churches. They're probably not going to be uh, microfilmed or publicized or anything like that. Um, in Romania, you can contact the churches. In my experience, it has not been very successful because, for many reasons, um, sometimes they're very under funded their churches are crumbling in some cases they're abandoned um they don't have scanners and copiers and they're just they don't they're overwhelmed and don't really have the time to help people with the research so the archives is probably the best place if you're looking in Romania but you can still try try the churches and if you go there in person or if you know someone or if you have a local researcher that knows maybe that priest is particularly helpful um you know you can try it definitely try everything you can um, David said that he heard family birth and death records were destroyed when during the Ceausescu regime when they burned churches. Is this true? And if so, how widespread was it? I guess I don't know about burning of churches, although that certainly probably happened. Um, there was a there was a that's another interesting history, but the Catholic Church was 
per, the priests were persecuted and then and some of them were imprisoned and killed uh there was a lot of uh there were a lot of problems but i think that you should try looking in the archives um during the communist era was when they kind of confiscated or required the uh donation or contribution of those church books to the local county archives so you should try there but if it is true that they've been destroyed uh, I don't know. I don't know if it's like here. I, I think that it would be where an, an original was kept and sometimes they made a duplicate. Um, so, you know, never give up hope. But I have heard of some situations where there just aren't any records because for whatever reason, they don't exist. And so then you might be looking at other alternatives. There were some I mean, they don't have census records, current census like we are familiar with them, but different communities might have different options available. Um, Kathy says that her mother was from Moldovia. What is the best place and the best way to begin research in Moldovia? Um, so uh, the Moldovan archives, uh, there are records there too, but it, it kind of depends um, because you're really getting into some areas where the boundaries changed. And so definitely need to know the village name and find out for sure where is it located today. And if it is in Moldova, then the records will probably be in the archives there. And it's similar, but I don't have um, firsthand experience with research in Moldova, which was part of Romania. Most of it was part of Romania um, during the um, interwar periods, I guess I'll say. And um, the records will be, you know, in Romanian. And so the, the way that they were kept and the types of records that you would find are probably the same. It's just exactly which archives are they in now might be a little dicey because of the, bo the border changes. Um, Elaine wants to know, uh, wait, forgive me, I think I read that one. I had heard that many of the family birth and death records. Oh, I just read that one too. I got to get rid of these. Um, my grandfather was born in 1873 and lived in Bucharest until 1948. He was naturalized to Romanian citizenship citizenship in 1940. I think he was Jewish. Does the naturalization just mean he had no citizenship because he was Jewish, or does it definitely mean he was born outside of Romania? Hmm. Hmm. I don't know that I can give you what I would consider an expert opinion on that. Um, I don't know about naturalization, Romanian naturalization. Um, maybe he was given a certificate of citizenship or something because during that time period, you know, you're leading up to uh, World War II. And uh, I would say that you can't really conclude that he was born outside of Romania um i think you would need to do some more research on that i mean jewish people traditionally have not been treated well throughout history and so um i don't know what that means exactly if it happened in 1940 that's that is a really interesting question um and i don't know the i don't know the answer with confidence as you can tell esther wants to know if you have any idea what the original name would be for a jewish woman if her nickname was lika Lika. I have seen that name for a man. Um, I don't know for sure, but what I would suggest if you're, if you're searching Jewish ancestors in anywhere, but as, you know, especially in Romania, um, jewishgen.org uh, is a really good place. And also um, on Facebook, they have some, um, a specialized group called, I'm trying to remember exactly what it is. I think it's Jewish Romanians from Romanian Moldova or something like that. So if you have, if you, if you're searching for Jewish, uh, there's a lot of groups that are actively transcribing cemeteries and indexing records and things like that. So it, it's just every, there's all these little exclusive little groups and you just kind of have to try everything and keep, uh, and one person will refer you to another person. It's just not so organized yet. Um, Darlene wants to say she, her purpose was tracking Romanian ancestors from passenger lists to their lives in North America. Any clues? Um, 
again, I think looking at, I learned this from a lady at the local genealogical society with the German society. And she said, always look for everybody from that same village that's on that same ship because you're going to find connections. And I have found that to be true. It's really time consuming. That's what you call an exhaustive search, right? But um, it is really helpful, especially the people that are, you know, that li are listed in the same, on the same page at a minimum. Um, but you will really find out a lot. Um, and, you know, never assume that those people weren't relatives. Uh, also look at who they were coming, who were their destinations, where were they coming to when they came here? Um, often they said it was an acquaintance or a brother-in-law or, you know, a family member. And so you can get a lot of clues by searching that person's um, experience, finding them in census records and so on. Um, so that would be my most important recommendation. Um, Esther says, do you have any hints from for families from, and I'm going to butcher this, Tekeschi or Focasani, F-O-C-S-A-N-I? Yeah, are we, I think those are, um, I think we're looking in the area around Yash, I think maybe Jewish Romanians, but I'm not sure. So I would go back to um, some of the recommendations about, uh, Google is my best friend. I always Google like everything, uh, find a lot of things that way. Um, but that Jewish Gen organization and then the um, Romanian Moldova group, just try to see if your village was within their areas that they're um, covering. Are there any Romanian genealogy groups in, in Ohio that you're aware of? You know, I don't know of any other Romanian genealogy society anywhere. I'll take, I'll say, uh, I guess there's an exception. Um, there's a Bukovina Germans uh, group, in, I think, in Kansas. Um, I don't think there are. And so, um, you know, we're wel you're welcome to join the Romanian Genealogical Society. Uh, you know, that's not strictly limited to Minnesota by any means. Um, but we would love to find out about more groups that are doing similar things. And we've even talked about, you know, what if we had like, so, you know, discussion groups or subgroups or, or something. Um, we were invited once to Canton to show our film, the, the thousand dollars and back. And I know there's a lot of interest in the genealogy, Rom Romanian genealogy in Ohio. So, yeah. Um, now, my question, my husband's family is literally two miles from the border of um, Hungary and Romania. Do you suggest we look in both countries for information? Yeah, um, I would say whatever, like, if you think that there might be something, you could look in that local county archives in Romania, you can look online, typically, they will have their collections listed online, maybe not the individual church books, like I mentioned, they might be those might be typed in a in a volume on a desk, but online, they do have um, some of their holdings. So you might look to see what they have. Um, the because the borders, the boundaries changed. Uh, and uh, but Typically, the church records are going to be, it would depend where they went to church and where those records landed, which archive. So, but, but yeah, I would definitely look at that's very close. Um, Jeffrey said a guide told us the reason we couldn't find any German grave markers in Villa Tessie Cemetery is because the Romas came in and replaced the Germans who left. He thought that the Romas probably destroyed all of the German grave markers. Hmm. This was not the case in Posmus. We found many, many familiar surname markers in that cemetery. We mm -hmm. were told there were no more Germans left in either village. The evangelical Lutheran churches in both villages were abandoned. We were in both villages in mid-October. Mm -hmm. I think maybe we, I think maybe we corresponded about that. Yeah, I, I think that's not, um, it's not real surprising. I mean, because, um, German people were, a lot of Germans were deported in the 1940s. And so, yeah, the, the homes are abandoned and um, have been, um, you know, uh, I guess I'll say recycled. And then also cemetery practices in Europe are not the same as in always as in the United States. Um, I know when I was in Norway too, you pay the rent on your, um, on your burial plot. And if it's not paid, then it can be, used for another purpose after so many years. And I think that happens um, in in Romania too, in other parts of Europe. Um, 
also um, I've seen a lot of places where they've taken the gravestones and moved them. And um, it's, it's not just like a given that they're going to stay in that place. So I think that's a really unfortunate um, situation. Um, I wonder, did anyone document those cemeteries and make a record of it? Uh, it's not as common to do that in Romania as it is here with our um, more serious, I don't know what to call it, fascination or interest in uh, family history research. But certainly there must be more clues, but we just don't know where to look for them yet. So. Um, Esther says, thank you for your help and informative session. Have you ever heard of the names Barcosi? V-A-R-C-O-C-I or Parlog, P-A-R-L-O-G? I don't have experience with those, but I'm not saying that they're not Romanian names. Um, you'd have to, we'd have to dwell on that a little bit longer. If you're really stumped on it, send me an email and I'll see what we can figure out. But I, I mean, I'm not familiar with those names. Lynn said she's not certain, but suspect some of her family members were Jewish. What's the best source of data to try to search for Jewish? Yeah, um, we had the same situation in our family too, where, you know, some, some family, some families, they were so um, persecuted that that information has been kind of buried, you know, Um well, I guess by uh, you just that exhaustive search, really, and starting with the most recent and keep working back to find all the records that you can that might indicate where a person um, was born so that you can go to find their, see if you can find them in the church record. Um, the, the rumor in my family was that my great grandfather was Jewish, but I found his record in the Serbian Orthodox church books. And because his name was Moisescu, it does sound like a potentially but it could it could be Jewish, could be not. We don't know. So um, I think it's just that exhaustive search, and um, in some cases, I don't know. Maybe we will never know. But I, I I don't like to take that for an answer. So I would keep I would keep looking. <laughs> Vicky, thank you. You've really helped a great number of us, and we really appreciate you doing this. I would remind people that your handout is in the chat, and the links for everything you've discussed, the Facebook group. Um, the Ge Roman Romanian genealogy group, they're all in that handout. So please take a moment, everybody, and get the handout and um, see if that helps you at all. And um, any other questions, I, you can direct them directly to Vicki. I think she listed her email on the handout as well. So thank you all for attending. We really appreciate it. And thank you, Vicki, for giving up your hour this morning to help thank you. us. Thank you very much. You all have pleasure. a good day. Thank you. Take all right, bye-bye now.